Can people hear me? Okay. All right. So let's start. My name is Diego Terral. I work for Igalia. I'm going to be speaking about the implementation of uh, GPU shader FP64 for Intel GPUs. So uh, this is how I would like to cover this. I'm going to start by uh, making a quick overview of, of FP64 and kind of talk a little bit about the scope of the implementation. Um, then I'm going to focus on the implementation itself, which covers NIR, uh, which is one of the IARs involved in the Intel driver. And then I'll focus on specifically on the Intel implementation, the driver level implementation, um, uh, which I think is the most interesting part. So this is where I will uh, spend more time. Now, this is uh, very Intel specific, of course. I suppose not everyone here is particularly familiar with Intel hardware, so I'll try to make this a bit more accessible and explain uh, a little bit how the hardware operates, at least the bits that are important to understand FP64. And I would like to wrap up the presentation with a, um, a recap of the current status of the implementation uh, uh, across the different hardware platforms that we uh, want to support. So, about uh, GPU shader FP64, this is all about uh, adding new GLSL types uh, for 64-bit uh, floating-point types. Uh, so, this, uh, we have doubles, debugs, uh, and demat types, which we can pretty much use for anything we want, uh, with two notable exceptions. One is 64-bit uh, uh, vertex attributes, which are covered with a separate extension. And then there is uh, 64, uh, we don't have 64-bit uh, from inside our outputs because we don't have 64-bit format, core formats for frame buffer objects anyway. So other than this, we support arithmetic and relational operators as we do with normal floats. Uh, and most of the built-in functions in, in GLSL also accept uh, double types with some exceptions that I mentioned here. Um, there is also new packing and packing functions for doubles, conversions from to 32 bits, and the other thing that's special about 64 bit is that uh, variants don't accept interpolation, so uh, you need to declare them as flat. So this doesn't sound like it's uh, a lot of things. We're basically adding a few new types, and that's it. Uh, however, the scope of the implementation is pretty large. Uh, this was combined work by Intel first and then Igalia for over a year. And as it stands now, covering Broadwell and Haswell, uh, well, um, so basically Haswell and then uh, Broadwell and later platforms, I count about 260 patches for this, covering NIR and, uh, and the Intel driver. Um, and this is without counting that EV Bridge uh, has more work queued up that will come hopefully soon. And this doesn't count work by other people who have been doing fixing things in the driver that helps FP64 in various ways, like Kuro's work on uh, fixing spelling things, or more recently, his work to enable to register offsets in the vector backend. So this is really a huge amount of work that has, uh, and that has happening here. Uh, so the reasons for this are multiple. One of them is that this feature uh, is useful across all shader stages. Uh, we have to implement it across various IRs, like uh, near, as I mentioned, and then the two, sc the scalar and the vector backends in the Intel driver. Uh, it affects a lot of the other stuff uh, that we can do, like algo operations, variants, uniforms, UVOS, VOS, shared variables. All these need to be to support 64-bit. And then there is a lot of uh, uh, internal parts of the driver that also need to be 64-bit aware, like optimization passes, liveness analysis, register spilling. So all these things, all these paths inside the driver need to be adapted to work properly with 64-bit. Now, it's not just about the scope of the implementation in Mesa. It's also about the scope uh, in things around Mesa, like Build-It. When we started working on this, uh, there was already some coverage for FP64 in Piglet. It was mostly focused only on ALU tests. Uh, but as I just mentioned, there is a lot more stuff to, to cover. And we added almost 2,000 new tests to Piglet to increase the coverage. And this was actually very important to catch things, code paths in the driver that didn't do the right things for FP64 that we wouldn't know otherwise. All right. So let's now look into the changes that went to near i'm going to cover this like very briefly uh since i want to focus on the intel specific parts so the big change that came here was the addition of uh, bit size allotypes 
So in the past we had things like near type float, and now we have things like near type float 32 and 64 uh, alongside the original base type. Uh, this means that we need to be a bit more careful when we handle all types in, in near or drivers that consume near code. Um, when we do things like checking for specific types, like in this little hunk that I have here, we are checking if a particular opcode, the output type for that opcode is a, is, is a boolean. And the right way to do this now is we use we compare it against the base type of the opcode because the opcode could have a bit size uh, type instead. So going forward, people should be aware of this change and think whether they want to compare against bit size types or the base types instead. Something that we didn't need to do before. So other than that, or Rather, as a consequence of that change, there was a lot of uh, work to do to make sure that every path in your uh, handled bit sizes correctly inside the driver and was delivering correct bit sizes to, to the Intel driver in this case. Um, there was a lot of work also for uh, making sure that we had um, uh, the possibility to use, uh, to, to declare the bit sizes involved in algebraic expressions, for example and validation to make sure that um, we got um, consistent and non-ambiguous um, uh, bit sizes involved in these rules that this was all uh, written by JSON. And then we have uh, new opcodes for conversions from into 32 bits, uh, packing and packing functions and things like that. And the other big change that went to near was uh, lowering for a number of operations that were not natively supported by the Intel GPU hardware. So I mentioned here a few of them. Uh, well, actually, these are all of them, trunk floor, seal, frag, and some others. Now, this, um, this lowering pass is available for any other consumer of near that may be interested in implementing the feature and has similar restrictions. Uh, and basically what this pass does is for those operations that are not natively supported, it uh, implements it uh, or implements this, uh, these operations in terms of 32-bit uh, integral math usually or other supported 4-bit operations. All right, so let's now focus on the uh, Intel driver itself, uh, which I think is uh, the most interesting part. And uh, some background first. Um, so in Intel hardware, we have two backends, uh, two modes of operation, which we call scalar and vector. Um, I'm going to cover the scalar backend first, which is easier, and then I will go in, um, into the vector backend. So um, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to explain how this works uh, outside of P64 and kind of use that as an introduction to for people who don't know the Intel uh, hardware yet. And then I'll explain how things, things change for, for FP64. All right, so um, the Scalar backend uh, works on Scalars. Um, so what I have here is a representation of three registers. Um, so the registers are 32 bit, uh, 32 byte wide. Uh, so if you think them as a collection of Scalar channels, they have eight scalar channels per register. Um, so here we have an operation uh, dispatched in SIMD8 mode, which means that we are processing data from eight threads at the same time. Uh, so you can think of that, for example, from the point of view of fragment, sh uh, fragment shader, where we have eight fragments that we are processing in parallel, whether, and we are processing one scalar uh, uh, element per, per thread. So um, what I have here is a simple move instruction where we are reading a certain number of elements which are colored in yellow here and writing them to the destination colored in blue. So the way this works is we start, the, the start of our region, uh, the region where that we are moving is starts at G1.1, so it's the second register and one uh, channel, 32-bit channel, because we are using a 32-bit type, a flow type here, uh, into the register, that's the start of our region. And then this ternary here uh, tells us uh, how we select the elements that we are going to move, starting at that point. And this is done as a collection of rows, so we have a 4 here, which is the width of the row, and a 2 here, which is the stride, so we take 4 elements with a stride of 2, all these in units of 
uh, floats, so 32-bit channels. So we take four elements with a stride of two, that's the first row. And then the next row starts eight float elements after the first, so it starts here. And takes another four elements with a stride of two. And we take eight elements because that's the execution side and that is here right next to the opcode. And then on the destination in blue, uh, we do the same thing. We write uh, at the beginning of uh, the register file, G0.0. We write with a stride of one, so we write consecutive elements and we write flows, so we write the entire uh, first register. Okay, so as you can see in scalar mode, we can pretty much address any scalar channel that we want and we use strides uh, to select the elements we want to operate on. So 64-bit is really the same thing, so in SIMD8 uh, dispatch mode we still have eight threads, uh, only that these threads now are uh, twice as, as large, so we have uh, eight 64-bit channels, each of which uh, are two 32-bit channels wide. Um, here we represent a DVEC4 worth of uh, data, so we have uh, the four um, components of the vector, because we are on a scalar backend, we process each uh, component separately because we only process scalars. So we have two registers worth of uh, data for X, Y, Z, and W. So uh, here is, uh, so basically getting um, double float operations to work is uh, relatively simple. We just simply use a double float uh, type to indicate that we are doing 64-bit operations. And that the hardware, with, with that the hardware already knows how to interpret this ternary here, which it does in terms of the size of the type. So this would mean that it would take rows of four consecutive double float elements and then move four, consec uh, four uh, double float elements forward to take the next row. In this particular example, this would give us, uh, since we start at G0, it would read the entire, uh, the full eight uh, double float components that we have in yellow and write them in consecutive positions in the destination. Uh, and again, because it's a double flow destination, it knows that it has to uh, align the data to 64 bit when it writes. So in FP64, we have some access patterns to data that I think were not very common before. Uh, this can happen for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is the log ring that we have in here for uh, unsupported 64-bit operations in which we uh, produce 32-bit integer operations that access 64-bit data, um, typically because we want to uh, operate on either the exponent or the sign or the mantissa of the 64-bit the, um, data. So in these cases, we need to produce regions that access either the low or high 32-bit of each 64-bit value. So what we see in this case is that we meet 32-bit instructions. So here this UD here means unsigned decimal, which is an unsigned integer, 32-bit data type. And we will use a stri horizontal strides of two to select just the low or the high 32-bit uh, components. Uh, so in this particular example, because I'm starting on the uh, second 32-bit channel, I'm selecting the high 32 bits of each uh, double float. And when we write, we write also in the second channel with the stride of two, of two. so uh, again, we write only the, the highest 32-bit uh, channels. Now, this is a very common in FT64, uh, um, but it might be necessary to do it also in other scenarios. And the best way to do, do this kind of regioning nowadays is to use the subscript helper that Core implemented instead of open calling these and adapting offsets, strides, and, and retyping registers manually. All right, so that was the scar backend, nothing very special there. Alliance testing on the other side is uh, a lot more interesting, as you will see. So here, um, the way this works is, uh, again, for 32-bit first. Um, so we usually use this with a dispatch mode that we call SIMD4x2. Uh, and what we have here is two threads instead of eight, like we had before. But we still operate on like eight scalar channels, uh, but these are separated in two threads. Each one has uh, a four component vector. So uh, because of this, we can use uh, swizzles and write masks directly, uh, which is one of the big differences. But it comes with certain uh, restrictions. Uh, one of these is that the regions have to be system byte aligned. So they have to start at the beginning of a register or halfway through it. Um, 
in this mode of operation, the hardware fixes the width uh, uh, of the rows to four elements, uh, four 32-bit elements, four 32-bit. Uh, so what we have is four contiguous 32-bit elements, which is 16 bytes, which is half of a register that has to be aligned at the beginning of the register file or halfway through it. So basically what we are doing is selecting uh, four component, four 32-bit vectors in the register file, in each register. Um, so with a vertical stride of four, what we are actually doing is a, an, 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 uh, a beginning of a, of a region that starts with the second register, we will be selecting in the first row, the first four components, and in the second row, the next four components. Now in SIMD 4 by 2 the two threads uh, are usually uh, uh, two different vertices, uh, and what we do is we load uh, data for one on the, uh, uh, on the first half of the register file, and the other half well, on, on, of, of each register, uh, and on the second half we, we load data for the second vertex. And within each of these regions we apply uh, these 32-bit uh, swizzles that we have here, and these 32-bit right masks. So in this particular example, we would be selecting Y, W, W, W for each uh, half of the register, so for each thread, for each vertex, and we would be writing only X and Y uh, for each vertex as well. So here we use swizzles and write masks instead of playing with, with the strides. Now, Broadwell and uh, later hardware used to require line 16 support for tessellation and geometry shaders. Uh, but thanks to the work that Kenneth did, uh, this is no longer necessary, and the, these platforms are fully scalar nowadays. Now, this was great for FPCT4 because it means that we uh, uh, we only need to support the scalar backend to expose the feature, and there's no need for Alliance Sting. Uh, all the platforms, however, still require Alliance Sting implementation. So Haswell EV Bridge uh, still need this for vertex shaders, geometry, and tessellation shaders. Okay, so um, why is Alliance Sting more difficult to get right? Um, well, one of the main reasons is that our Swizzle channels are always 32-bit. So um, that means that if you have a DBEC4, you can only address half of it um, with, with, with these Swizzle channels. Now, to make things a bit more interesting, uh, even though the documentation suggests that grid masks are 32-bit uh, too, they are actually 64-bit, with the exception of two specific grid masks that are 32-bit, which means that they don't have a native representation at all. So this is kind of a bit crazy, really. All right, so. Um, SIMD 4 by 2 in Alliance 16 uh, basically um, is um, set up like this. So we have, um, again, four channels per thread, which nowadays require, well, so that instead of, uh, uh, unlike 32-bit uh, request a full register per, per vertex, so the thread boundary now is in, in between con uh, contiguous registers. Now, because of the system byte alignment restriction, the hardware seems to fix the width of the rows to just two double float elements, which gives us still 16 byte rows, um, which then we can address with our 32 bit swizzles completely. Uh, but these 16 byte rows only cover half of a debug 4. So with this regioning uh, 2 to 1, what we get is uh, four rows, which look like this. Um, and well, if we now apply our uh, swizzle directly. This is in, uh, intended to be C, W, and double float units. So what we want to select here is the second half of uh, the debug 4 for each vertex. But what we do if we apply this directly instead is to select channels C and W for each row that we produce, so we end up selecting something else. So this is not what we want. Um, Another consequence of this is, uh, if you think about it, is that we cannot represent all the swizzles natively. So if we want to represent the replicated X swizzle, we can't because any swizzle that selects X is going to select C and so forth. Um, the other problem that we have is, okay, we have to translate our swizzles from 64-bit uh, to 32-bit. Uh, that's easy enough for X and Y. X becomes XY. 
why become CW? But what about C and what about W? How do we access this? It's not directly possible. So to um, avoid all of these issues, the first attempt at implementing this was to use component splitting and um, try to split uh, DBEC operations into DBEC2 sizes, so we would only operate on just uh, two components at the same time. Uh, so we would uh, organize our DBEC4 data in register space a bit different. Instead of having X, Y, C, and W for each uh, thread in the same register, we would have the first half of each register uh, packing two 64-bit uh, uh, two, uh, components. So X and Y in one register, C and W in the next register for both vertices. So we are recreating the thread boundary that we had for 32-bit somehow. And uh, then when we uh, actually need to implement an instruction, we would split it into two four-wide uh, instructions instead, the one operating on X and Y. We just translate the scissors directly, nothing special there. The one operating on C and W would have to offset the register by one and then uh, address C and W as if, as if they were X and Y. Now the problem with this solution was uh, um, non-uniform control flow. Um, so the thing here is this happens when we have a vertex that uh, meets a condition and executes conditional code but the other vertex doesn't. So in this case the hardware still thinks that we have four consecutive channels per thread. So the, it, it delivers this execution mass that they have here. So four ones and four zeros, meaning that we should execute the four channels for the first vertex and none of the channels for the second vertex. Now the problem is that our instructions intend to operate on two components for each thread, for each vertex at the same time. So when we execute something that attempts to read just uh, X and, uh, and write it somewhere else, it's going to do that for four components, but each one, each of uh, um, two components, it, two, um, each two components belong to different thread. So we end up moving X for, for both vertices because C and, w, C and W channels for the first vertex are enable. So this is definitely not what we want. So we are back to where we were before we had to drop that solution and start over. Uh, and one of the problems we were discussing before is we need a way to address component C and W. And one way we can do that is, well, we can start our region uh, at the existing byte offset instead, and then translate C as X and uh, W as uh, CW. And if we were to do that, we would end up with something like this which is uh, a bit better. Now we select C and W, but we select a bunch of stuff that we don't want. Also, this would be invalid assembly because we would be violating uh, some restrictions of the hardware. But we could probably fix that if we use vertical stride of zero to limit the region that we select to just C and W because that would replicate the row uh, four times. Now the problem there would be that we wouldn't be selecting the right source data for the second thread because we would only be selecting CNW for the first one, but we would probably use SIMD splitting uh, and have two different instructions, each one processing data for just one vertex to, to address that. Now, the interesting thing about uh, Jensen hardware is that it seems to have a bug that actually helps with this. Uh, it is that the vertical stride when we set it to zero uh, is not respected for the second half of a compressed instruction which for FP64 pretty much happens all the time. Uh, and so what happens is that um, when it decompresses the second half, the, 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 the one that deals with the second vertex, it just ignores the vertical stride and always offsets a full register. So if you think about what happens when we do that, is that the, we end up with this regioning instead, which is exactly the one we wanted to, to use. Uh, so actually when implement this uh, in this way for Jensen hardware, we're asking if we were to implement this that we don't need to because now protocol and later are scalar, we would probably need to split the instruction into. Now there is one more issue with this uh, particular example I have here, and is that I mentioned before that the X Y grind mask is actually 32 bit. So we are not really writing two components worth of data, we are only writing one. 
which is again not what we want. And because there is no native representation for this gray mask, the only way to deal with that is to uh, end up scalarizing anyway and split into instructions, uh, one right into X and one, one right into Y uh, separately. But this should work. Now, the problem is this was just one example. I mean, there are more suicide combinations you can think, for example, on cross back 2 suicides uh, that would require different strategies to be implemented. Um, there's also uh, instructions with two or even three sources where each of the sources involved in the operation might require different strategies to deal with the suicides they have. Uh, and if, when you apply these strategies, you can end up in a situation where you may need to review uh, again the swizzles involved and see if you have to again apply any techniques or you end up with a right mask that is one of the 32-bit right masks and again you have to split because of the right mask so we thought that you know just trying to deal with all of these up front would be a bit uh, difficult and it would postpone uh, um, having a functional implementation so instead we decided you know, maybe in the end we end up having to scalarize a lot of this stuff because of all these restrictions. So why don't we just scalarize everything up from, and then we try to build up, uh, build up from there and improve things where it makes sense. So that's what we did. Uh, the first step of the implementation is scalarize everything that gets rid, gets rid of the problem with the grind masks completely because you uh, only have one channel grind masks. It only uh, it reduces the um, the number of swizzles you have to deal with to just four swizzles which are easy enough to implement, X and Y, you just translate them directly. C and W, you use the trick that I mentioned before, and that's it. Uh, There's one thing that's important though, and it's that uh, the Swizzle translation for 64-bit to 32-bit, we do that, or we want to do that after, you know, as late as possible, so that the optimization passes and, th and things like that, that like this don't need to know about the all this crazy stuff that happens, because otherwise it would be really mad to deal with all that. So uh, once we got that working, the second step is, well, there are some swizzles that we can implement uh, natively. Basically, any swizzle that selects the same parts from each of the two rows that cover an entire DBEC4, this we can implement natively. So X, Y, C, and W, for example, is meant to select the full DBEC4. So that's exactly what you select if you apply the 32-bit X, Y, Z, W swizzle to each of the two DBEC2 that you have. So this we can do directly. Um, the next step is you can exploit the issue with the vertical stripe a bit further and use that to implement replicated swizzles, for example, because now, thanks to that, you can limit the swizzle to just one uh, DBEC2 chunk. And if we want to go further, we can also do that, but it would require to look at the swizzles involved and think how you can split them in ways that you can implement uh, following these strategies. Uh, with the caveat that, as I said before, that could be a recurring problem and, uh, with the right mask and with the other sources involved in the operation, and you may end up scalarizing uh, more than you uh, were hoping for. But we haven't done this yet. Uh, we are hoping to kind of uh, uh, get all the other bits uh, well and done, uh, landed uh, before we attempt to do this part. So that's uh, kind of the basics of how this works for both backends, and then there is a lot of other stuff that goes in between all this. Uh, one is that, as I suggested before, there's significant differences across the hardware platforms that we have been working with. Uh, with. Uh, so EV Bridge, I think, was the first to support FP64, and it has some annoying things, like the fact that the uh, um, ternary that describes the, um, this, the, the, the size of the elements that you actually select, the regioning, is in units of 32-bit always, so that means that you have to duplicate the, uh, well, the parameters and the execution sizes, uh, which, again, you want to do as light as possible to not mess with the bulk of the driver. It, uh, it's also a lot buggier than, than uh, the uh, later generations. Haswell uh, got the region in right in, in units of 64-bit and then improve a bit the, the few less bugs. And then Broadwell, uh, we can do a scatter there, so we just uh, forget about the crazy alliance system stuff and we just do a scatter, which is great. And the scatter was the first platform that we didn't have to do anything special for. Uh, 
which so I, I hope that you know future hardware doesn't require a lot of uh, tweaks uh, to to get things working. So other platforms such as Braxton, ShareView, or Braswell, um, they only require really minor adaptations. So that was that was fine. So another thing we had to deal with is the fact that before FP64, uh, all GLSL types were mapped to 32-bit types in the driver, and that meant that uh, we were free to assume uh, that the sizes involved in the operations were always 4 byte, which uh, now it's not true anymore. We also assume in a lot of places that we uh, the strides that we use yes, were just you know one, which is not true anymore. Uh, a lot actually in FPC4. So we had things that were uh, in this hang that I have here, we were computing the size of a destination, the number of registers that we were writing, and we would do that by dividing the execution size by 8, which is implicitly assuming 32 bit types and a stride of 1 on the destination, which uh, breaks for FPC4. Uh, so the right way to do this going forward would be to use this uh, helpers like component size that. Uh, take into account all these parameters to get things right instead of open calling these kind of uh, computations. Now the problem with these things is they were difficult to track and, and that's why uh, we wanted to have good Piglet coverage so that Piglet would tell us uh, what paths were broken because of things like this. So um, as I said before there is a lot of new well, not, not so many, but there are new code patterns that we push with FP64 into the driver, like uh, horizontal strides that are not one, uh, um, access to the same register with sizes of the uh, types uh, that, that have different sizes and different instructions. And some of these really drop some optimization spy, uh, passes uh, crazy. In particular, copy propagation got patched at least seven times to fix different things that I didn't like at all FP64. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there are still more bugs related to this. Okay, another thing is uh, the GPU only has 32-bit read and write messages. Um, so for all things that involve memory access like UBOS, VOS, Scratch, uh, URB, things like this, uh, we end up having to do some special handling of 64-bit paths. Uh, and I think it's better explained through an example. So we are back to the scatter backend. And remember, we have this 32 bit, so we have a 32 bit channels that we are processing in parallel. And for each channel, we want to emit a read, uh, so we provide an offset. Uh, we read data from that from uh, each channel's offset, um, and and then the GPU will write the result back into register space, um, uh, and it reads 16 bytes, so a back four worth of data for for each thread. And it writes it, you know, just like we want in 32-bit. So each four by uh, each four byte component in a separate register within the same channel. So this is how we want things for 32-bit operation. However, in 64-bit, um, there's two issues because the GPU can only read 16 bytes. At the time we need to emit another read when we have anything larger than than a DBEC2, of course. But then the other problem is uh, because they are 32-bit messages. Uh, our 64-bit data is channeled through a 32-bit channel, so we end up with uh, the low and high 32 bits of each 64-bit uh, component in separate registers, which is not what we want, and we need to shuffle this data uh, back, in, uh, back into valid 64-bit data we can use. Uh, now, when you want to write, uh, you start from this situation, and you want to prepare data uh, like this before you uh, write to memory, so you have to do the inverse operation. Um, so another thing is uh, there's no support for 64-bit immediates in uh, in John 7. Uh, there is some support for this in Haswell. There's a specific instruction that we can use for that. Uh, but EB Bridge doesn't even have that, so we have to kind of uh, load using 32-bit instructions manually into uh, virtual registers and then using uh, corresponding swizzles and strides depending on the backend to, to make sure that we address the correct data. And then there is a number of uh, either restrictions from the hardware or bugs uh, affecting both the line one, but especially the line system. Where well, usually I, I don't think I have time to go through all this in detail. But the basic uh, a common denominator is that uh, 
F sixty four at least has all the features with compressed instructions, so that we either get wrong execution masking for the second half of the instruction, or we get uh, it doesn't do the right thing with the predication mask in some cases, or it ignores the the vertical stride as I mentioned before, or things like that. Now the good thing is that the solution is uh, pretty much always the same, which is to uh, uh, split the instruction so there's no compression involved, and that works. Uh, so in the case of the scalar backend, where we already had a SIMD splitting pass, this was just a matter of adding the uh, the new situations in which we needed splitting for F64. Uh, for alliance testing, we didn't have that infrastructure in the driver, so we had to create a new pass for this. And yeah, so to wrap things up, uh, current state of the uh, implementation is we have already shipped uh, F64 with Scalar and Broadwell. This was thanks to the fact that uh, we only need the Scalar implementation for these platforms. Uh, Haswell and Ibridge need Alliance Sting, which uh, has been in the works since then. So for Haswell, we have working implementations of uh, Shader F64 and also Vertex F64 bit. Uh, for F64, we send uh, the patches for review, a first version of it, and we got feedback. We are working on it, uh, and we will send Vertex Drift 64 bit probably after uh, F64 is in with enough shape to that. Uh, as for EV Bridge, uh, we have also been working on that. Um, we have the Align uh, one backend adaptations ready and seems to be working. And Align Systing is a work in progress, but it's uh, nearing completion. So there's only a few, couple dozens or three of pilot tests to go, I think. And the only thing that hasn't been started yet is uh, Vertex Drift 64 bit for EV Bridge because uh, we want to get F64 ready before we, we start getting. I, I, I don't think it's going to be a lot of work after, uh, or a lot of changes uh, from the Haswell implementation, hopefully. And that's all I had, so if you have any questions, I'll try to answer. I was, I, I guess I was very clear. <laughs> So how's the how's the rest of it going? It's a, I mean there's still a few things left to do and I mean there's a bunch of stuff that's that's in review. Is it? Oh yeah. Do, so do you, do you foresee more pain? <laughs> no, I think the the hard part, especially for the system, was to understand how the hardware actually worked. I mean, like I remember, the beginning was quite painful because um, uh, yeah, there's these bags and I have actually a slide here. Uh, where you know you, you were trying just to get the basic thing working, which was a simple shader that would load the uniform and just write it to the output, and you would hit two bugs, uh, and it was like this just doesn't work. Uh, but once you figure out what are the actual problems, uh, and Kuro was super helpful, giving us uh, solutions and suggesting things and testing things um, for us. Um, so I think once you got that. I think it was fairly easy to go forward. And now I think uh, we got some feedback from Kuro to, uh, on, the, on the patches that we sent. I think at this point, it's, you know, it it's, should be all straightforward, I think. Yeah, you guys have done really, really great work. Thanks. Thank you. OK, so if there are no more questions, I guess we're done.